So Giovanni, I think you can start now. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Giovanni Raffa, the chair of the Young Neurosurgeons Committee, and I'm very happy to welcome you today for this last webinar organized by the YNC for the 2023. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Stefan Motto, the, ma the member of the YNC who organized this webinar, and also to the speakers and to the participants to the round table who accepted to discuss with us today about a very hot uh, neurosurgical topic. Uh, before starting, I want also to invite you all to the next Young Neurosurgeons Meeting and Research Course that will took place in Hamburg, Germany, from the 19th to the 21st of April 2024, in which we will discuss also about the topic of today, that is spinal oncology. So after this very brief introduction, I don't want to waste your time anymore because the topic is very interesting. So Stefan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giovanni, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our new webinar format. Um, we chose a more case-based approach today in order to discuss some everyday issues which we um, have in our practices and um, also some very special and some extremely challenging pathologies and uh, approaches because they afford sometimes multidisciplinary workup, and in order to choose the right treatment for the right patient, we always have to outweigh the risks and complications that might happen. And I think, in, especially in spinal oncology, um, we have to deal quite often with those problems. So um, I'm happy to introduce you to our topic, spinal tumors, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And first of all, I'm going to introduce you to our faculty, um, Yumi Riang, the chief of uh, neurosurgery department in uh, Helios Buch Clinic uh, in Berlin Buch. Um, she's also um, the chair of the ENS Diversity Committee. Then we have Andreas Dimitriadis with us, um, who is the former president of the ENS and um, also a member of um, the spinal um, section of the ENS. And also, we have, last but not least, Martin Stinnen, a colleague of mine, and also co-chair of the Eastern Swiss uh, Spine Center of St. Gallen, and also former young neurosurgeon. Um, they will present their cases, and um, we will discuss them afterwards with the roundtable. Here we have Marisa Gandia, former chair of the Young Neurosurgeons Committee, and now chair of the Individual Members Committee, and uh, Michael Schwake, Malte Mome, and Felix Schengel, colleagues of mine from the Young Neurosurgeons uh, Committees, um, who will also answer some of your questions during the presentations in the Q&A box. I would um, like to ask you to write your questions, please, in the Q&A box, not in the chat, um, and we will discuss some of them at the end. So um, first, uh, Martin, I would like to ask you to present your case. Okay. Can you see my screen? Does that work? Yes. Okay, well, um, thank you, Stefan, and all for, for having me on board. My name is Martin Steenen. I'm a neurosurgeon. I work in St. Gallen, Switzerland, and I'm in love with the ENS for more than 10 years now. The topic, intradural tumors, is the good topic, and um, probably they gave it to me because I'm the... You said the former young neurosurgeon, I'm still young as a neurosurgeon, but I'm talking about more benign pathologies, I would say. I was thinking, you know, maybe focus on the really good ones, the extra medullary, but I thought maybe that's too boring. So I'm going to talk a little, about, uh, little bit about the intramedullary tumors. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Just to start with a recent case of mine, 76 year old, uh, with a history of prostate cancer and atrial fibrillation, he had progressive le left thoracic pain, especially at night, dysesthesia, hypesthesia of the left trunk and leg. And he was noticing a progressive gait disturbance. He was a tactic when I saw him in outpatient clinics, but he didn't have any motor deficits. We always have patients to fill out those patient reported outcome measures. You can discuss if that's appropriate for intradural tumors, but he had an ODI of 20 and a back pain of seven out of 10, leg pain three out of 10. That's the image that he brought with him. And um, first, when I saw this, I was like, ooh, that's maybe a challenging one. And I was wondering what that is. 
you can see the T2 sagittal view with a lot of black, which is likely to be hemorrhagic mass. It could be a cavernoma, but maybe also some kind of neoplastic spinal cord tumor. I was also thinking of a metastasis. It has some edema. Um, and, you know, I don't know what your opinions are on this. We can discuss this later on. For me, because of the progressive uh, neurological deficits and his attack the gate, I was sure I would go into surgery with him. And that's the setup that I usually like to use. I, for intramedullary, I go for a laminoplasty. I don't like unilateral approaches for intramedullary tumors. For intradural extramedullary, I try to preserve the midline structure and the contralateral facet as much as I can. Then I always use the um, ultrasonic aspiration device. I use the microscope, of course, uh, neuromonitoring in all cases with D-Wave, if that's possible. And I love the intraoperative ultrasound, and I will show some images uh, further down. That's the first view when I opened the Dura. You can see there's a black mass coming to the surface. I thought, hmm, maybe that's a melanoma metastasis. I don't know. And that's the view on the ultrasound. On the axial view, I can define my entry side where the tumor comes to the surface. I can see the spinal cord around it. And I always try to map the anatomy, the structures um, around my, my tumor. And I'm thinking the motor, the motor tracts are probably pushed to the left, to the right, and anterior. And I try to stay away from that. Here, I achieved a near total resection without risking any functional deficit. I was stopping when the D-wave monitoring was showing decline. Um, because I thought probably it's a metastasis and we have a second line treatment ra with uh, radiotherapy and maybe immunotherapy or something. And he was discharged without any deficits four days after. The surprise came when the histopathology came back because they didn't find a melanoma. They found a melanocytoma. And he was extensively worked up from the dermatologists. They didn't find any malignant uh, skin tumor. We didn't do a FDG pad, which was negative. We sent the histopathology for a second opinion to Zurich University. We had several discussions. We did CSF puncture. We didn't find malignant cells. And then we decided for additional radiotherapy. Um, and I saw him recently at six months without any tumor recurrence. And I was looking up these cases, melanocytomas of the spinal cord are extremely rare. There's only a few published uh, cases so far. And I was just thinking if there's uh, people here on the on the web who are having experienced similar cases, we could maybe even pool these cases and do a meta-analysis or something in the future. That's just a, an opener, um, a recent case. I'm going to just give a very brief general overview and then discuss another controversial case and maybe finish up with some tips and tricks if there's still time. So epidemiology, very rare, 4 to 10% of all primary CNS tumors. Incidence, fairly low, 0 0.5 to 1.4, over 100,000. So in Switzerland, where we work and practice, we have about 40 to 110 cases per year. In our center, we see about 25 to 30 um, in average. They can be extradural metastasis, primary bone tumors. We're going to talk about this maybe later on. Then we have the intradural extramedullary, typically meningiomas, schwannomas, but also ependymomas and others. And we have the intramedullary ones, ependymoma, astrocytoma, sometimes glioblastomas, hemangioblastomas, METs, and other non-neoplastic lesions like cavernomas, which we shouldn't forget. The case that I'm going to focus on today is a 59-year-old female. She had a history of breast cancer two years prior with resection, radiotherapy, and endocrine therapy and no uh, recent evidence of active disease. She came with a progressive burning pain and a hypesthesia of the left more than the gr right groin area for the past two months. She was some unsteady on the gait, and she had also voiding difficulties. And when I saw her in outpatient clinic, she had an attack the gait pattern, hyperreflexia of the lower extremities, and no motor deficits. And that's the MRI that she brought. You can see the contrast uptaking mass, intradural, intramedull uh, intramedullary, and you can see on the T2 sagittal view that there's the small lesion with a lot of edema. It's uh, one or two segments above the conus. So we found this intradural tumorous lesion at the T10 level. It is a singularity lesion. We did MRI of the whole neural axis. We did a PET scan of the whole body, which was negative for other tumors. Um, 
I thought the patient has a tumor which is not near the posterior surface, but it's evoking a lot of edema. She has a hist history of breast cancer. What is the histopathology most likely to be? Probably malignant because she has a lot of neuropathic pain that shows that there's something bad going on. The benign tumors don't make this neuropathic pain so often. And I thought maybe it's a breast cancer metastasis, but I wasn't sure. And, you know, my question would be now, who would who would operate on this? Who would only irradiate without histopathological tissue? And, and we in this um, case decided to go in. I discussed this at the tumor board. I told, I told them I probably can can remove it pretty safely. I can open up the spinal cord in the posterior surface. And I thought, you know, where are my motor tracks, as I usually do. And, and this is what we actually did. You can see here in the, in the ultrasound before dural opening, the lesion, and it is not close to the surface. I always feel bad when I have to go through so much eloquent tissue, but we could resect it with the ultrasonic aspirator and then even chase the tumor capsule with this uh, Roton 5 uh, dissector here. Um, Postoperative course was favorable. I have the good case. So it was a complete resection, slightly reduced left uh, leg uh, strength, but she recovered over time. She had um, improved neuropathic pain, and the histopathology now came back for an amelanotic melanoma. So she didn't even have a breast cancer metastasis. It was a melanoma which nobody found before. She was when she went to rehab, she regained her normal walking ability, and she had adjuvant radiotherapy and immunotherapy. And we recently saw her for two-year follow-up. She's tumor-free, living an active, independent life. And this is the early postoperative MRI where you can see no um, big defect of the, of the case. Why I chose this case? There's very limited evidence for or against microsurgical treatment for intramedullary meds. And due to the better oncological treatment options, we will see probably more patients with these meds in the future. The technical advances enable resection with preservation of spinal cord function. Patients with known malignancies may have unknown second or third or fourth tumors that require a completely different treatment strategy. So we need to get tissue. And currently, we're also trying to fill this knowledge gap. I'm happy to have Felix also as a panelist on this call. He's running a, a European, but also North American multicenter study. Also, Malte Mome and the guys from, from Hamburg are contributing like many others. And if you scan this QR code, you can find the clinical trials entry of the study. If you're interested to particip participate, you can contact Felix or me, and we can maybe add you to this, um, to this study. Um, do we have time, Stefan, for a couple more tips and tricks real quick? Yeah, you can proceed. Okay, just... This is going to be brief. So I like to keep the spinal stability to a maximum. I mentioned that for intramedullary tumors, I like to see the midline. So I want to see where does the spinal cord end to the left to the right? Where's my midline structures? This is where we do these laminoplasties, as you can see here. You can do this with a with a cutting knife. You can also use a little burr. However, if, if it's a junctional tumor and if it's not intramedullary, it's intradural, but extramedullary, I personally favor a unilateral approach, sparing the tension band and the contralateral facet. Um, I also like to use the intraoperative ultrasound before I open the dura. I always check, and you can see this in the video, that I can see the end of the tumor. If I don't see the end of the tumor, then I do the bone work and do the hemostasis before I open the dura. This is very important for me. Um, also, you need to know how the nerves are doing. So generous use of intraoperative neuromonitoring for intramedullary tumors. Even sphincter nerve stimulation, we did a case of conus tumor last Friday, where we do direct nerve stimulation and also sphincter EMG. For extra medullary, I think it's optional in my opinion. Um, you should avoid pressure on the spinal cord at all times. So what I like to do is, I mean, this is a fairly small tumor. Maybe here it wouldn't be necessary, but you can always open up the tumor and then kind of... Um, do the internal debulction and the dissection of the spinal cord like you would operate uh, meningiomas um, uh, on the brain. So kind of just do like an internal debulk and then dissect the, the shell of the spinal cord without pushing too much on the spinal cord. Um, you should know whether your lesion is densely calcified. They can be, for example, in these meningiomas and you don't want to push on the spinal cord. And there's a 
a very interesting, we call it the spatula tip. It's a device that you can put on your ultrasonic aspirator to cut sideways. So you can kind of like Swiss fondue cheese, you can just, you know, piece by piece uh, irradiate, uh, take it take it off without pushing too much on the, on the spinal cord. Then uh, lastly, ventral and dorsal tumors in respect to the spinal cord are a completely different story. So the dorsal compressions are very simple to resect. However, if the tumor is anterior of the spinal cord, you have to release the dentate ligament. You have to think about very lateral tra trajectories to walk around the spinal cord, and these can be more challenging. And that's actually all I wanted to say in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I uh, didn't expect you going to put together a whole lecture on it, but it's really informative and I think um, it's very good for all our um, residents and people who are who have joined the session. So I would suggest to proceed to the next case. Um, Yumi, the stage is yours. You have to unmute yourself. OK, now you can see my presentation. Yes, thank you. Great. So hi, my name is Yumi Ryang. Uh, Stefan already uh introduced me so i'm the head of department of neurosurgery and center for spine therapy in berlin Buch. and i'm going to show you a case which uh was not so straightforward it could have been um but there were some things that maybe were not optimal but um i think it's a typical case where i hope you can learn some things from and next time you see a case like that you will do everything the right way from the beginning Okay, so this was a 12-year-old boy. He presented to us with uh, recurring headaches. Uh, he complained of back pain, which was pronounced between the shoulder blades, uh, and he had that for several years. Uh, he complained of weakness in both legs since two to three weeks, and also numbness in both legs, but with changing localization. So there was no dermatoma that was... Um, um, specified there and he had no relevant comorbidities uh, no medication he was very anxious and he had a syringe phobia uh, and on examination by the pediatric neurologist uh, he had an atactic gait uh, paresthesia of alternating localization in both legs no major weakness no bowel or bladder disorder and upper extremities and cranial nerves were intact uh, however, they thought because he was very anxious and this guy, when he was 12, but he's like uh, six feet tall, he was like very, very tall. So he looked like uh, a grown up person. Uh, they thought he had a dis uh, dissociative disorder, so they didn't really take him seriously. Um, they did a cranial MRI, didn't find anything. So they said, OK, this guy is crazy. Uh, yeah. And then a couple of days went by. And he really developed a progressive weakness of both legs. Then they called the neurologist and asked him to do an examination. And he found, uh, yeah, frankly, found a um, spinal cord injury, Frankel score C. So he was not able to walk. Um, he had a proximal accentuated weakness of the lower extremities. He had hyperactive uh, tendon reflexes. He was severely atactic when he was able to walk, but uh, um, in the course of the clinical, um, of the, of the, in the course he was not able to walk and he had bilateral positive Wawinski signs. So he said, we need an MRI of, this, uh, of the spinal cord. That's what we did. And that is uh, when they presented the case to us. Um, I would say that I was on vacation during that case. Um, so I was just, called by phone and they said, oh, there's this boy with this really strange tumor. Can you take a look? So I took a look and I talked to the head of the department of the pediatric oncologist and uh, said, okay, I, I want a CT and um, I want a biopsy. Um, from this imaging, 
they were highly suspicious of a malignant primary tumor. I mean, he was 12 years old, so we thought it could be a Ewing sarcoma. And yet this really large intraspinal extradural tumor component with spinal cord compression, um, blood count and all clinical chemistry, everything was uh, within normal limits. There was no abnormality there. So what would be the next steps? I mean, unfortunately it's not very interactive, but uh, what we were thinking was, does he need neurosurgical debulking and posterior instrumentation? Should we go for a CT guided biopsy or emergency new adjuvant chemotherapy because we thought it was a Ewing cell coma or more imaging? Um, at that time, um, my consultant uh, told me the, guy, the boy has no neurologic deficit, he's just ataxic. So I said, okay, we can't do surgery before we have a histological proof of what it is. So, um, yeah, that was like Friday night and I was on vacation. So that was the problem. And I wasn't told the truth. I mean, I don't know if it was by intention uh, or, yeah, I can't really tell you in backside. So um, I asked for CT and they didn't do it. So the pediatric oncologist started with an emergency chemotherapy because it's Friday night. And they thought, yeah, we don't, we have to do something. So they started with this really aggressive chemotherapy. They gave it to him for three days. And usually these, uh, if it is a Ewing sarcoma, these uh, tumors do uh, respond very well. So they were expecting the boy to improve neurologically, but nothing happened. So the next week on Monday, he finally got the biopsy, um, which was denied by the neurologist uh, the week before. And also the CT scan, which I wanted from the beginning, uh, they wouldn't do it because they said, oh, it's radiation exposure and this is a boy, we won't do it. So when you see this image, if you have seen a lot of primary bone tumors, you might already know what it is. So if you're very experienced, you could probably tell what it is. And um, of course, it was not a Ewing sarcoma. So when we did the biopsy, it came out that it was no malignant tumor, but it was a hemangioma. So the chemo was stopped and they asked us again for help. And um, yes, it's a benign tumor. Um, a hemangioma usually does not need any surgical attention, but um, in this case, it was an Anakin classification stage three tumor. Uh, it was um, compressing a spinal cord, so the diagnosis was aggressive variable hemangioma. And these tumors need surgery, as you obviously can see. So we thought about surgery, but how would we do it? And should we do embryolization before? Yes, you should do that because these tumors are benign, but they're really highly vascularized. So if you cut into this tumor, it will bleed profoundly, even if you do a biopsy. So your neuroradiologists usually don't want to do biopsies in hemangiomas. So we decided, okay, he needs embryolization and then surgery. Um, but because he had had this chemotherapy, we had the problem that he was just after the chemotherapy, of course, he was in the nadir. So he didn't have any leukocyte count at all. It was like 0.39. So there was no chance that we could do any kind of surgery. So the surgery had to be delayed for about two weeks. Luckily, I was back from my vacation then. So I could do the surgery. Um, so he had embolization and the next day, or I think maybe the same day, I can't remember, uh, we did surgery. Um, we did a posterior stabilization and laminectomy and decompression of the spinal cord. And uh, about one week later, I mean, the boy really, luckily he recovered from the surgery. Um, we did a um, vertebral body resection also from posterior because I think it was T3 um, with a carbon uh, fiber peak cage. Also, the posterior instrumentation is carbon fiber peak. If you wonder why you can't see the the, the pedicle screws, um, it went. Everything went really well. There was just one uh, tear of a of the T three nerve root, which was repaired by a, a stitch and also a tackle zero patch. So this is a, one of the 
intraoperative images. You can see the uh, decompressed spinal uh, tickle sac and the ligated nerve roots and also the cage already in place and the, the screw rod system. So the patient um, uh, had an excellent recovery. Uh, luckily, I mean, there were some things that probably could have been done better. Uh, he was able to walk and then he was um, transferred to rehab. So I was really happy. But he came back about two weeks or one week after he was discharged to rehab and he had this really small wound distance and there was some secretion coming out of there. And we did an MRI scan and yeah, this was highly suspicious of a CSF leak. So he was, he had revision surgery and in every revision case, we always do interoperative uh, swaps and send them to microbiology because we want to rule out any sort of infection. And of course, he had a low grade infection uh, was a cutibacterium proprioni. Um, we treated it for 12 weeks with antibiotic therapy and he was transferred back to rehab. So everything went well and he hasn't come back yet. So I think mm -hmm. uh, we were able to manage this infection. Okay. So, yeah, what did we learn from this case? Um, it's even if the head of department is not there, you should complete diagnostic workup if you have the case of, of a malignant primary tumor, because um, if you don't have that, if you don't have uh, the right histology, you're not able to treat it correctly. So you need the bias biopsy first before you do anything. Only in case where you have an uh, emergency setting where the patient has a high-grade uh, sensomotor deficit, you can go for surgery to do tumor debulking and stabilization. And then, if it's a Ewing sarcoma, do the um, chemotherapy. But in all other cases, you need to have the uh, histology, then you do neoadjuvant therapy if it's a Ewing sarcoma, and then you do the surgery. In that case, he had neoadjuvant therapy uh, without uh, pathological proof. So I think this is something that really has to be discussed. I think it's not okay to do that. Um, the pediatric oncologists, they were like, yeah, but we didn't know what to do else. I think this is a no-go. And also to do surgery without his pathology. So yeah, this is um, the message that you really need to uh, remember if you have Suspicion of a primary tumor, you need to have this to pause pathology first before you do any sort of therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yumi. And um, it is obviously a rare case, but a very complex one. And you can see that um, this is one of the cases where you need most, mostly a very multidisciplinary approach in order to find um, the right therapy for this patient. And um, this is kind of a rare pathology where you can make some mistakes as you obviously showed and um, I think at the end I'm going to ask you something about it because it's um, kind of interesting who has the lead in those cases you know mm -hmm. so um, let's proceed to the last case um, I would like to ask Andreas to present it thank you Stefan and uh, everyone on the panel including our young neurosurgeon's chair. Giovanni, thank you for your kind invitation. Um, my case is one where, let me just reduce this one second, where things look pretty easy. Um, can you see now or not? Nope. Nope. Not yet. Oh. And now? Yeah, it starts now. Okay, great. So all consent uh, obtained, uh, but uh, this is for the purpose of the conversation here. Um, I'm presenting the case of a 51-year-old right-handed lady who presented with progressive right-sided, in other words, dominant arm brachialgia lasting about three weeks. She also had neck pain and admitted to the occasional dropping of things from her hands. And her background was positive for only 
breast cancer, triple negative, for which she underwent a wide local excision, selective lymph node biopsy, followed by chemotherapy, and there was no local recurrence. Um, you know, there was only mild weakness in the hand at that time. Uh, reflexes were not brisk at presentation. Uh, and she had relevant investigations. I'll show you here uh, a couple of images, and I'll show you some more in the next slide. But effectively, the MRI did show a C8 nerve root compression that was uh, consistent with the hand weakness. There was cord displacement, de despite the absence of any obvious long track signs. Uh, particularly, there was this displacement at T1, but there was no high signal in the cord. The CT itself showed extensive multiple spinal metastases and spinal canal compromise. You can see on the top left the T2 sagittal and axial images at uh, a couple of levels. Uh, in fact, they're all T2 in this case, at three different levels. You can see the amount of anterior involvement. Uh, you can see the canal, you can see some asymmetrical findings. More importantly, I'll show you the, the T1, but also the CT, where you can see extensive multiple metastatic deposits and relevant to this particular situation, the lytic involvement at the cervical thoracic junction. There was also a metastasis with lytic component higher up. Uh, here we can see the lytic problem of the meds at the level of the compression, but also the fact that the posterior elements were also involved. And I'm not showing you all the parasagittal slices, but there was involvement of the elements above and below posteriorly in the parasagittal views in the lateral masses. So at this question, I don't know, Stefan, at this point, if you want to get any questions out, whether people would operate or not, for example, some might go, go for radiotherapy or not, others might say operate. And if you do say operate, whether we go from the front or the back or both and how, is it something you want to discuss now or not? Oh, I think uh, if we start to discuss it, we might uh, need some more time. Exactly. Because it's kind of very complicated situation, and um, you're presenting a case of an extended um, disease with some with multiple metastases with pathological fractures, and this is always uh, kind of challenging to to say what is the right treatment. And I think we just we proceed with your case and see what happens. Yeah, I'll show you what we did. Uh, so basically, clearly, like anyone, we started wondering what do we do? Do we operate? Do we not? Do we go from the front? Do we go from the back? And if, if we do both, which sequence? Um, she, and this was, by the way, an outpatient uh, conversation. However, um, in the next uh, few days, I think it was just over a week, uh, she was admitted as a semi urgent uh, case. Basic investigations, slight, slightly low hemoglobin, otherwise, normal mean cell volume. Uh, C7 and T1 uh, compactly was performed. So I decided to go from the front because that's where the compression was from. And also because there was a lytic component that I wanted to address. I had judged that the clavicle uh, was quite low, even though this was at the cervical thoracic junction, I felt it was uh, within reasonable access. And we managed to do both C7 and T1 corpectomy and replace that with an expandable cage and plaint. The operation proceeded as planned. The estimated blood loss was about 100 mils. During the approach, we identified the lump. Uh, we weren't sure if, we were, if it were a goiter or not, but it was uh, quite a, a significant, uh, like a small ping pong ball. Uh, which we plan to discuss with oncology. So there's some concerns that there may be also some thyroid dysfunction that wasn't picked up before. During the procedure, 
the inferior thyroid artery was identified and preserved. There was a minor ooze. So instead of coagulating, we tried to weld it, as we call it. In other words, we touched it briefly with a bipolar uh, on either side of the bleeding point and it stopped. And for the next two hours, uh, there were no other issues and no particular concerns. Uh, day one, postoperatively, very well, no dysphonia, no dysphagia, keen to go home, which we always let our ACDFs go day one post-op, but for, because this was a, a more extensive case, I had advised it to stay behind. Uh, the hemoglobin was a bit lower, which was another reason to stay behind, and there was a plan to give her a couple of units anyway. Uh, we did some thyroid tests, raised T4, low TSH, we got some endocrine input, uh, and in the meantime, uh, I had uh, requested a SOMI brace because I wasn't planning to do a second stage uh, in the same sitting, and I was going to wait and see how she develops in the next uh, few weeks. She was comfortable planning to go home the next couple of days. Day two post-op, you know, the ward round, well, about to step down from high dependency. She already had a low molecular weight heparin. However, it was quite interesting. It's a Friday, as always. Uh, during the conversation with one of our senior trainees, uh, she complained of neck pain and actively developed wound swelling, compromising her speech and her swallowing and describing dyspnea or showing dyspnea. Uh, and uh, our trainee, acting appropriately, removed the clips, the clips immediately and there was a jet of high pressure blood released. The research team was called because actually she lost consciousness at that time. Um, so then there was a, a whole new action activated in parallel. The surgeon was contacted, the anesthetic team was contacted for a major hemorrhage uh, protocol. She was transferred to one of the ORs where she was uh, intubated, transfusion started. A CT in parallel was contacted for a CTA neck. There was indeed a pseudoaneurysm of the inferior thyroid artery with active contracts extravasation, and the CT showed a massive hemothorax. You can see that most of the blood actually must have been slipping slowly downwards into the chest as opposed into the wound area over the previous uh, couple of days. Um, in red, you can see the parallel actions at the bottom. Interventional radiology contacted, cardiothoracics contacted, and an emergency OR mobilized uh, with both cardiothoracic and neurosurgical teams. Team one, neuroradiology, they found it very easy to embolize this because we weren't sure if it, this was going to be the real cause of it during the operation. The first operation, the inferior thyroid artery hadn't bled much. Uh, so the angio was effectively trying to look at if there were any other bleeding points none other were found this was coiled transferred to theater and in parallel the cardiothoracics with a videoscopic uh, access evacuated the hematoma and left a drain or two while the neurosurgery team opened the cervical wounds uh, and cleaned out with a washout transferred to icu postdoc recovery Extroverted the next day, neurologically unchanged, happy with the post-op imaging, chest strains left for a couple of days more, and then stepped down to the ward. Endocrine had the chance to come and see her. Um, and the on this occasion, after the second uh, operation, she did have some uh, dysphonia and hoarse voice and dysphagia, which improved by the third day, but she ended up staying three weeks as opposed to the planned three days after the first operation. And that gave a chance for oncology to get involved with palliative chemo radiotherapy. Why is this one of my worst cases? Well, this is a relatively young patient. I know she's not a spring chicken, as they say, but uh, she was a, a, actually a very young patient, still has three young children and potentially lethal complications with social and family consequences. And one cannot help asking, could one have done differently? Uh, some of the things to bear in mind, the good things was uh, specifically the good teamwork, the immediate response to hemorrhage discovered on, luckily on the ward round, uh, and the 
parallel activation of several teams, including the intervention on neuroideology, the cardiothoracics, and the neurosurgery, so multidisciplinary team activation. Uh, but then there's some questions about uh, post-op bloods, responses, whether wound drains would have made a difference or not, preoperative anemia, what should that have been optimized? Was the goiter really an issue? Uh, I don't think those are major burning questions, but these are the things that I have thought about since. Uh, but the main message is good teamwork for RISAS, stabilize the patient from the cardiovascular point of view, move to the angio suite, deal with the problem, and then move straight to theater with a tandem to operations uh, and the ICU input. But lots of learning points from otherwise a relatively straightforward case for your attention. Thank you again. Thank you, Andreas. Very rare case also of uh, complication. And I think this is something that can happen to anybody of us and uh, can happen even during a basic ACDF procedure sometimes. Um, so it's not specifically actually for tumor patients, but also in straightforward cases, sometimes this is a complication we have to think about and we have to manage very quickly in order to save the patient's life. And I would like to open the discussion round now. Um, I think most of the questions have been answered in a Q&A section, but maybe the panelists can start with some questions uh, based on your cases. Otherwise, I have a question for you, Andreas. <laughs> yeah. With your current experience, um, would you have changed your strategy or your approach retrospectively? Yes. Yeah, so would you have gone for from posterior because she also obviously has a pathologic fracture in, I think, C3, and you can also stabilize her on a, you know, with a long construct, and uh, maybe, maybe at this point um, she would have been transfer to the radiotherapy like in the second week after surgery? Or do you think it would have not been possible? Yes, it's a good question, Stefan. I think always we have to ask ourselves what would I have done differently? I would still have gone from the front and, and the reason is the following picture here. The absence of anterior uh, support at the cervical thoracic junction uh, was the reason why I went from the front to prevent further collapse and cord compromise because the symptoms she had were the occasional dropping of things was very, very occasional and mildly suggesting myelopathy, but on examination, there was no obvious signs of uh, upper motor neuron lesion. The reason I didn't want to go from the back is because I knew the alternative would have been a very long construct, but in the images I had seen, there were metastatic deposits on most of the levels. I'm not showing you here all the paraspinal uh, views, um, but I'm, you know, I was concerned that the posterior construct would not have been strong enough and there was high risk of loosening. Um, May I ask a, a question, Andreas? Please, yes, of course. I didn't, I didn't understand what was the primary tumor. Did you, did you mention that or was it? Known yes, at it was time? the triple negative breast cancer. Breast okay. cancer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think um, I personally, I would have also come from the front. She also had signs of, of I think, radicular involvement. And you really want to get that tumor mass out. It's so lytic, junctional area. I don't think a posterior construct, unless you go to cervical pedicle screws and maybe double rods or something could, could stabilize that. I would, however, in my hands, I would... I would do front first, but then add the posterior because it's it's junctional. It's a two-level um, corpectomy, junctional, and you have involvement of the posterior elements. I have, <laughs> I didn't show it now because I was asked to show the good case, but I had a similar case that failed and he came back with spinal cord compression because the cage dislocated. I would be very careful here in the long term. Of course, this is a very uh, progressive disease. You know, I could see the mats everywhere and there's not even good evidence that you should surgically treat those patients. You know, the patch shell mm -hmm. paper excluded those patients. Right. I, I would treat the patient, but I think I would do a front back and then go for radiotherapy. And probably the prognosis is not so good looking at the rest of the spine. Yeah. I agree, Martin, uh, you I... make good points. Um, Effectively, we did plan a two-stage, not on the same sitting, but the experience 
the prolonged experience of this admission um, urge the patient in the end to to decline the second step and this is quite a few months ago now it's a it's a year ago i uh, i know she's still doing relatively well very well from the neurological point of view but not so well from the the, the cancer point of view uh, because triple negative is actually quite a a, a tough prognosis but on the whole i uh, i would have done the same thing my other concern is whether i should have coagulated completely the inferior thyroid artery because that is what bled. And at the time of the operation, it didn't bother me much. It stopped very quickly. Um, and for the following two, two and a half hours, there was no issue. Overall, 100 mils lost. So, so I don't think I would have done it. The reason I didn't completely coagulate it is because I knew she has cancer and I thought there's a thyroid lump. If I now compromise the blood supply to the thyroid, I will add another problem, potentially. Uh, I don't know if if it would have made a difference or not in that respect. But again, uh, my original decision to go from the front, I would still do, yes. Andreas, there's a, another question to your case uh, from somebody from the audience. Um, they are asking, um, Based on what you said, the resident opened the wound and it bled from the aneurysm. So this wasn't stoppable. Uh, this is what the colleague is assuming. How was the patient brought through the angio with a massively bleeding wound until neurosurgeons and thoracic surgeons went in? Okay, yeah. Did they um, compress it then or what did they do? So effectively, the wound, we we out of habit. It's, it's not that this happens if ever. However, we have out of principle uh the advice that uh, a clip remover should be left by the bedside of everyone who had an acdf for the very occasional and rare poss possibility of an anterior hematoma that causes compromised breathing and on this occasion it worked because it was open immediately the blood clot was removed there was no profuse bleeding out of the wound at that time it was just the blood clot that was there came out and then no further bleeding. Uh, so they did some packing or? Yeah, they, they covered it with a, yeah, with some gauze and quickly transferred to to theater for intubation and angio. So it happened actually a lot quickly. Uh, of course, you can ask what would happen if this was discovered at three in the morning on Sunday night. Uh, but luckily it happened on Friday morning. Uh, there's another question by Arion. Thank you, Arion, for uh, your comment. I agree. Yeah, it I think Marissa has a question. Yes. No, I just want to say, want to say congratulations to you all three because the cases are very good. And my question is for Andreas, but it's very, very simple question. You ask at the end, uh, the, does the wound drain will have changed something? Do you think that the wound drain Will be will make a difference. This is a, a little thing, but I don't think there is agreement between us. Not yeah. even between us. I personally don't use wound drains. I haven't used the wound drain for ACDF for more than 10 years, and I've never regretted it. But this is not an ACDF, it's a corpectomy, two-level corpectomy and cancer. Uh I'm more open-minded to using it for corpectomies. But at the end of the case, it was really, really bone dry. So I didn't want to put a drain. I didn't. Would it have made a difference? I don't know, of course. It's speculation. I suspect not. Because I I remember cases when I was a resident when this sort of thing happened when when you were on call and you had to do something about a case like this and the drain was always empty. But, 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 but there's, there's, there's evidence on this. On this. I mean, we, we know from, from large meta-analysis, I don't know why I hear myself twice, twice. Um, that the drain doesn't reduce the rate of revision for hemorrhage. You know, it makes the surgeon feel better, but the revision rate for a symptomatic hemorrhage is the same if you use a drain or not. So, I mean, we do use a drain regularly, but we wouldn't need to do that, according to the literature. And I mean, for a two-level copectomy, I would use a drain. I'm sure I would. Um However, I don't think in this case a drain would have prevented from revising when, when you see, see the huge hemat hematoma. No chance. That's why I'm asking because I think yeah. it's quite controversial still now. For the ACDF, I think we all agree that we don't need it. 
But for any other case, for corpectomies, that is is not clear. And what about about the others? What do you usually do? Malte, for example, or Felix? Well, for we usually um, use drains for ACDFs, um, but um, we are in the process of of reducing that. But for corpectomies, um, I think they have an effect in the first one or two hours, and after that, probably not. Yeah. My, so my my question is, how do you guys monitor patients operated from from the front? Um, Copectomies, ACDF standard procedures, because I heard in, in Germany it's quite different uh, how they the patients are monitored. So they in in, in at the UK they go to uh, a monitoring uh, ward for twenty four hours. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, Malte. You know they go to the neurosurgical ward. Uh, if there's any concern, is that a general ward or is this a, no, a kind a of neurosurgery. intermediate care? No, it's a it's a level one neurosurgery ward. Unless mm -hmm. you have concerns intraoperatively or beforehand, then you plan to have a level two, what we call here high dependency unit. So, so if I mm -hmm. have particular concerns in advance, then I book an HDU bed. Mm -hmm. Or if during an operation you may have a, a particular uh, intraoperative concern, then again, you can raise the level of care by going to a level two. Level mm -hmm. two basically is for non-ventilated patients, uh, but with uh, one to one or one to two care. Okay, yeah. because all of our ACDFs go to IM IMC, and I, I, I doubt that this is this is necessary. So, yeah, yeah. There's a nice. No, in other countries they do it on outpatient clinics uh, yeah. level, so discharged in the same day. And another question is to to Martin uh, regarding the intramedullary tumors or uh, extramedullary tumors with a high, with a lot of medullary compression. Uh, can you say something about perioperative uh, steroids and uh, what do you do when your uh, neuromotor monitoring decreases? Thank you, Malte. Well, good question. So use of cortisone, um, usually not. I mean, unless they come highly symptomatic as an emergency and I see spinal cord edema, I might consider giving it. But most of those patients are, are rather elective, especially the extramedullary ones. So I don't, I don't, I don't use it on a regular basis. What, what do I do? I mean, for intramedullary tumors, if the, if the motor evoked potentials go down, or let's say the D wave monitoring goes down, first I see is it is it because of me or is it because of something else like blood pressure, etc. So I stop the resection, I rinse. I talk to the anesthesiologist, I ask how the blood pressure is, maybe we elevate the blood pressure, and I just um, discontinue with resection. I ask the, the electrophysiology team to repeat the measurements, and usually what you see, it it you know comes back to normal or goes, goes up again. If it doesn't, if we have like a stable decline, I think, can I proceed but change the strategy, maybe change to a different location? Because I don't want to risk the nerves, um, you know. I don't. I don't want to risk the functional outcome. So, if it's a stable decline of neuromonitoring, I might consider use of ultrasound, see where the resection is, how much is left behind, and if I think I cannot safely take out more, I I stop there. You know, do you differentiate between, radicality. let's say, if your D wave is persistent and your MEPs are gone, you keep going, or? Yeah, if the D wave okay. is still still there, then you know the D wave allows me to be more aggressive. But if the D wave goes down, you know more than thirty percent, for I I get a little nervous, and I don't want it to decline more than fifty percent. We know that the D wave declines by fifty percent, but not more. Patients will wake up with a deficit, but they will recover by six or twelve weeks. If it declines by more than fifty percent, they will likely have a persistent motor deficit. Because we. Um, with Professor Vespa, we did a lot of intramedullary tumors, and the experience is that most of the time the MEPs are really they don't give you a good overview of what's the post-operative deficit. So, yeah. and there's actually but, but... some papers who discuss that you should keep going in some circumstances if you have a decline, and that is not 
you don't have a reason for that. Um, um, and um, the patients will do fine. Um, and the risk is actually higher um, if you stop and, and reoperate. Yeah, reoperation is always more challenging. I, I would agree to that, you know. The problem is I, I had recently, recently a lot of... of tumors in the conus region where you cannot use uh, the D-wave monitoring because you have to insert the catheter distally, but there is no distal cord. So that always feels very awkward to go blindly into the spinal cord. I don't like that. Felix, uh, you have a question mm. and then Michael. Yes, thank you. Uh, regarding the, to this question and to, um, especially to Malte, do you use um, a checklist um, especially in cases um, of a decline of your intraoperative monitoring? Um, the, the, the question was for me, right? Yeah. Maybe. Well, for uh, no, speakers, uh, I mean, we, we talk closely with our, um, with our um, physician, physician's assistant who does the monitoring. And then we, but we check if, if, if uh, anything happened during that decline. So we, we go retrospectively and see when, when it happened and how big the decline was. But, but you don't have a checklist where you go each item. All right. Michael. Yes. Well, one thing very important what Malte said, and that's a problem of interoperative monitoring. If the MEPs and D wave are so good, you know the patient is going to be okay. But they're, if they're getting worse, you don't know what the outcome is. It could be that the patient is going to be worse, but on the other side, it could be that the patient is going to be okay. And if you stop projecting the tumor, so you will have a case that the patient will be bad and you will leave tumor inside. So you will have like double negative outcome. That's the problem with, with monitoring. I think it's sometimes very good for for the surgeon for feeling good, but um, sometimes it can be very misleading. I think, yeah, it's it's not everything. It's not all about the monitoring. I have a question for Yumi, maybe the last one. Um, often in oncological cases, the oncologists have the leading part and what was the case in your case? Did they decide what to do? And did you have a you know, presentation at a tumor conference or was it just on emergency, emergency basis and they did a consultation with the spine uh, specialist and decided to go for chemotherapy? Yeah, I mean, this was like uh, special circumstances. I mean, this is a 12-year-old kid. So he was uh, in pediatric oncology. So they, they were the leading department. And um, usually the case, if it's not an emergency, we discuss it in a tumor board or in a sarcoma board. We have both in our department, in our uh, hospital. Um, in that case, it was, I think it was not discussed because uh, everything happened like Friday night um, and the pediatric oncologists thought they need to do something. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't want to, take myself out I mean I could have made mistakes also but I was not in the hospital and um, if I had been there I would have um, I would have insisted to have a CT and a biopsy before they did anything I think in my opinion this was the major major uh, mistake tumor he received very aggressive chemotherapy he lost all his hair which has not come back yet um, and also we were not able to proceed with surgery when we had the diagnosis because he was in the nadir and there was no chance to do surgery. Um, so this was something that I was really, yeah, I was really mad about this, uh, that this happened. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that was a problem because, um, yeah, because I was- given... Maybe he was also more prone to infections afterwards. Yes, I think I think uh, he had an infection because he was uh, he had, he received very aggressive chemotherapy. I think otherwise uh, he would have maybe not have gotten the infection. I mean, fortunately, luckily everything went well. I mean, I hope he's not going to come back because of uh, screw loosening or something. But this is again another thing that we might have been able to prevent uh, if if we had uh, done the biopsy first. And also the CT scan. I mean, the CT scan 
if you're experienced with primary bone tumors, you will you you will have seen right away this is hemangioma. Um, of course, we would have proceeded with biopsy anyway, just to be sure. But only from the CT, I think you could have seen that it's an hemangioma and not a urine sarcoma. So I think like the pediatric oncologists, they didn't want to do the CT because they said, yeah, it's it's uh, it's radiation exposure. But I mean, if you think it's a primary malignant bone tumor, I mean, what the who cares? I mean, just do the CT scan. It's a very bad coincidence, probably, and uh, the timing Friday night is always yeah. uh, a bad one for those cases. But um, Malte and Felix have uh, two more questions. Um, one thing, maybe to to all the other panelists, uh, how often do you use uh, preoperative embolization in in tumor cases, and what's your indication there? Um, I mean, in the literature, it's always described for renal or uh, highly vascularized tumors, but in practice, I think it, it varies quite quite strongly between different departments. If it's possible, I would like to answer to your question because we recently published a paper in Brain and Spine um, on this particular topic, and um, we have done a survey among the ENS uh, spine surgeons, and we have found out, as you say, um, it's very heterogeneous and um, everybody is deciding on their own uh, basically standards and there are no really uh, identical standards in different countries and in different uh, centers so um, as you said major um, diagnosis or major differential diagnosis for embolization is still renal cell carcinoma thyroid carcinoma mm -hmm. and maybe some highly vascularized tumors um, in the mri and the angiography but uh, not everybody's thinking about it and it's basically dependent on the histopathology. Maybe Alex, you have one more question? Or recommendations? Of course, of course, totally. All I can yeah, tell I you is that I requested one small multi, I requested an embolization of a, what I thought was a vascular a renal metastasis once, and I was reassured, don't worry, it's going to be fine. And uh, putting a Jamshidi needle in the level above, not the involved level, but the level above, and taking out the uh, inner thing to put the wire through it, and there was projectile, um, projectile bleeding through the Jamshidi needle. So I just simply put the, I recannulated it, sealed it, and I called the radiologist who had declined it to come to theater, to see it. Patient was transferred into the angio suite immediately quite an impressive vascularity of the tumor uh, and since then i've never been re rejected another case when i requested it <laughs> but it always takes the one to put the fear in you but for for renal i always do to be honest if you can read why why not you can always provide you something in the or for example for the aneurysmatic the same it's very big it's big bleeding in the or if you don't and we also do mobilize before lymphoma that, and lymphoma um well, if, if not diagnosed before but usually lymphoma you have uh most of the times you don't have any bony um bony involvement so in this case i usually don't do um it's it's, it's 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 not I meant for embolization, but it's a, a tumor that um, is uh, bleeding a lot. Yeah, that's true. As I, as I told you, it's very heterogeneous, and uh, there are plenty of um, research publications on on this topic. And I think we, as you said, Martin, we need some guidelines. We have to think about it and uh, design them. And Felix, you have a question since a uh, couple of minutes. I think <laughs> you want yeah. to ask us. Uh, one last question uh, to Yumi, maybe, uh, because you showed your case um, with a with a car car carbon peak um, implants, and I was um, wondering, do you use those radiolucent implants regularly in every spinal uh, tumor case, or do you make it dependent on the possibility of radiation or proton radiation? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, 
Yeah, we use it in every tumor case, uh, even in metastasis, because I think it has uh, advantages uh, concerning post-operative imaging. So if you do um, control imaging in these patients who are long-term survivors, uh, I think it's better if you have carbon peak in there so you can better detect tumor currents. I mean, there's up to date no study on that. I would have, I would love to do it, but it's very cost intensive and very a lot of work. So um, I asked the company to support me and they uh, agreed to do that, but uh, I haven't heard from them since then. So um, I think this is one important uh, point uh, for uh, control imaging. Um, otherwise, it does not have, to be honest, it does not have, have any like big advantages concerning radiation therapy. I mean, it does have some advantages, but in spinal nets, it's not that significant. But if you have a primary uh, bone tumor that needs to be uh, irradiated with protons, then it's really crucial you have carbon peak inside, otherwise you will not be able to do a proper radiation therapy. Um, I think this is a very important point. And in this young boy with this benign tumor, I wanted uh, carbon peak just to have, um, just in case there might be a recurrence, which I don't think, but um, he will receive control imaging for the next three years. So uh, in that case, is, I prefer to do carbon peak. But of course, it's very expensive. Um, and um, some hospitals are not allowed to use that because of that. Okay, so thank you very much to the faculty, to the panelists, uh, to all of the participants. We had at some point mm -hmm. 150 participants today. I think we covered a lot of topics. I think it was a very educational event. And thank you very much for your participation and uh, your contribution. So have a good night and uh, see you soon. And save the date for the ENS Young Neurosurgeons exactly. meeting. Exactly. In, uh, Absolutely. If you want Absolutely. to... Keep continuing talking about spinal oncology. You must come to Hamburg. We love yeah. it. 19, 20, 21 of April next year. The topic is the spine, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, spinal, spinal oncology, oncology and spinal minimal invasive surgery. Just throw it um the chat. We will wait for you there. We will see you there. So bye -bye. see you bye -bye. soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.